Cool. Ready to All right. Listen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by a couple of friends here to talk about our journeys coming back to God. I'm joined by Romeo with PBF Live and uh, Doc from Dis Disgruntled Docs. How are you guys doing today? Hey, doing awesome, bro. How are you? Doing great. Doc, how you been, man? Good. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's honestly uh, pretty cool, <laughs> but we're good. <laughs> Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for actually you guys extended the offer to me because uh, we're actually streaming on multiple platforms and also on your guys' end um, to chat about orthodoxy, to chat about really living. Uh, I guess we've we both had similar backgrounds in regards to sort of uh, degenerate lives, uh, drugs, uh, nihilism, all this different stuff, and then finding through the grace of God orthodoxy. So. It's, it's great to be here and chat with you guys, but if you guys want to start, because uh, I know that I'm kind of new to your guys' audience, and then uh, you guys are, I'm sure actually some people follow you guys on Instagram, but uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves and, and kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the whole thesis here of, of today's stream is kind of coming back to God and, and, and who you guys are and what you're doing. For sure. I can go first if that's cool with you, Doc. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, PBF. PBFCKS. Uh, we've been around for a while here. Uh, I'm Romeo from PBF. And we started out around 2012, uh, Facebook groups. You know, we were um, about just exposing some of the hypocrisy of the military uh, and just trying to bring some honesty to the table. But at the same time, too, we had that real edgy, degenerate kind of way that we did a lot of this stuff. And so we definitely um we struck a nerve with people in both ways you know whether it was positive or negative and it was definitely an extreme kind of thing in doing that we have consistently over the years gotten ourselves um, deleted from platforms simply because of i think early on you know it was some of the degeneracy um you know just pushing the edge pushing the envelope of things you know, we're on our 38th iteration of the page right now, and we've just been, we're only on Instagram at this point. And really at this point, it's sort of some of the things that you've gone through now, right. whereas in the past, it was more of a degeneracy kind of thing where we were um, bringing, you know, attention to ourselves. Now it's more about just questioning so many of the things that are going on in the world. And, you know, it's, it's been through this because especially when we moved over, it, it, we do a lot more long form writing when we were on, uh, on, on Facebook and, you know, there were things that we did that were picked up by, you know, bigger newspapers, which was cool. Cause we did like a five part series on Facebook, just going after, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the, what is the name of it, doc, the veterans, the, what am I thinking of the disabled the veterans? Warrior. Yeah. Wounded warriors. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We did like a five part series on them. We, we dug into their, paperwork of their uh you know their taxes and things like that and you know they were just they were funneling money to them and their friends they were only spending the same amount of money on veterans as they were spending on parties for themselves and these are guys with their legs blown off that they were sending socks to you know things like that wow so wow. it was you know trying to expose that type stuff and we got into more doing memes we got on instagram and it was in the process of doing that and i've talked to you about this uh it was really about um, you have to, to make memes. And you talked about this with Jim Bob, you've really got to understand and you want to bring a new side to things. But in the process of doing that, because, you know, I was a guy that was like smoking weed and uh, drinking a lot and things like that. I completely sobered up and I started just seeing how insane the world was. Mm -hmm. I had a, a friend that took his life and uh, I went to his funeral at a church and the church was covered with like LGBT you know, a bunch of, a bunch of that type of stuff. And it was, it was during that process where I was, you know, just trying to come to reality. And it was really at that point, And that was probably, I don't know, it was some crazy non-denominational church, you know, that I had, right, to be right. you know, I, I did the search and I ended up stumbling upon a podcast with, um, it was Jim Bob, it was uh, Primal Edge, uh, Primal Fitness, and it was um, Jay Dyer. 
Yeah. And it was on that uh, boy, boiler room, I think was what it was. Oh, on. yeah, the boiler room, yeah. Yeah, so they were on the boiler room, and it, a suggestion that they made in that was to read Father Sarah from Rose and also get the Orthodox Study Bible. Well, I wasn't ready for the Study Bible myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, I was trying to come at this from a very rational approach, you know, right. like, okay, let's, let's follow logic, guys, let's, let's do all these things. And it was um, after reading the second chapter of Father Seraphim Rose's nihilism, I put the book down. You got it there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this For is definitely. A book. Oh, and, and you got the, the, his, the, the soul after death. Too. Oh, yeah, I got orthodox. Oh, you got all this stuff. Future, yep. Yeah, anybody watching this, this is this is some good stuff to get here. But seriously, after I read that second chapter, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, there's there's so much here that he's saying that he's hitting on that I was thinking about and that he's really touched that spiritual aspect. And that's really what started me on the path. So then because they suggested getting an Orthodox study Bible, I got an Orthodox study Bible. There and it was go. just yeah. And and opening that up. And the footnotes are so amazing and really getting yes. introduced to the church fathers. And so, you know, I've been almost a year now. I've actually, I was chrismated and, um, you know, I've just been where we had a podcast and we were much more on sort of social commentary, kind of political type things, things like that. We've definitely gotten into a lot more of the spiritual aspect of things. And I've been doing a lot of the podcast here with, with DD and really we've got a lot of guys who are thirsting for this knowledge and that's why it's really great that we've got the opportunity to talk to you because you're going to i think help introduce our audience if they don't know you already that they can you know look to you for some information and especially you know like the patristic faith that you're participating in those group of guys that are orthodox <clears throat> and really just giving people so many guys are so lost now yeah. and i just want to help out in getting guys to some place where there's good people with good knowledge and we can continue good, getting them on a path of, you know, repentance and just getting them their lives. Right. Cause I think right. a lot of guys want that. Well, glory to God that uh, even, you know, the, the winding road that you've kind of been on and I, we were talking privately, you know, that your priest is father turbo and um, he is a great, great gentleman. And uh, really, I actually want him to come on to the, the, the podcast sometime and, and chat. Um, and so orthodoxy, it is one it is for the seekers. And so if I can do anything to try to uh, lead any of the young men in the right direction, uh, glory be to God. Yeah, for sure. You know, there's a lot of, you know, um, in, I think after Doc Talks, and then you can talk to our audience a little bit, too, as well, because I think there's probably people that follow us that aren't familiar with you and what you went through. Cause I think it's a really interesting story to share as well, because, you know, one of the things that um, you experienced that, you know, I, it, it, it saved me in some ways. I don't want to say it saved me in the way that Jesus saves, but it helped me to get my mind right. And I struggle with this and we can talk about this more later, but it was doing hallucinogens that right. snapped my mind into a direction that actually got me out of that atheist standpoint that got me to the point of like, look, I'm seeing things here and I'm experiencing things here that are quite spiritual and I can't rationalize this information, but at the same right. time, too, it's helping to push me on the right path. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll definitely, uh, definitely dive into the whole, the psychedelic stuff here in a moment. Uh, doc, do you want to, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of where you're coming at to this conversation from? Yeah, so uh, it's Colonel Docs. Um, I've been doing this since like 2014, and kind of along the the same lines of uh, Romeo, kind of been doing memes and more uh, medical, I guess, commentary when it comes to things like that. Um, doing a lot of calling things out, things that are unfair, and there's a lot of things wrong with the military and things like that. So doing a lot of that for a long time with a, a bunch of other people in our page but now it's just me myself and i i guess <laughs> but uh i grew up pentecostal uh for like a good amount of years and uh, th that was a lot of fun uh <laughs> a lot of different when it comes to that side of the house of denomination and then i stopped going to church for a long time and then i came back and became an evangelical for a good amount of years and then i joined the military well i went i tried going to college and then there 
you know, doing a lot of things that shouldn't have been doing, drugs and all kinds of things, and then right. eventually cleaned up, and then now, you know, joined the military, and then cleaned up a, and been completely sober, but then going along with a lot of things that are happening in the military, that culture of just being kind of extremely negative, but at the same time, like, trying to build people up at the same time, and just, but still falling away from from the grace, and then consistently drinking, and treating people, like, really bad, and then eventually, like, I was like, yo, I can't be doing this anymore, especially after, like, deploying, seeing things in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then mm. you see things, and you're just like, how do I come to deal with a lot of these things, and I knew about, about God, but, like, it never really quite hit me, like, as, right. you know, maybe last year same thing like uh, i was searching for more and then i was volunteering at uh, a church where i'm at and then i started seeing things that just weren't quite exactly what they were and then luckily you know romeo funny enough that he's the one who was like hey, i sent him a meme and it was one of uh father josiah treadham and i didn't know it was <laughs> <him>. <laughs> oh then, okay and then he's like oh that's you know father josiah treadham you should check him out on youtube so i was like all right cool so then i started looking into him and then I started looking more into orthodoxy into the early church and then i think someone recommended me uh becoming orthodox by uh peter gilquist and oh yeah such a great book and then it, it was all the stuff that kind of i was uh experiencing trying to look for more truth and then just same thing like looking at things of the world it's like you see all these things that are changing it's like well what hasn't changed within the church and then looking for those answers for me just kind of helped me solidify it's like okay <laughs> orthodoxy is like the only thing that hasn't changed since like it began so right now it's been maybe like a like a couple months now that i'm trying to get settled in a in a parish and everything but yeah it's so you a wild ride <laughs> so you grew up uh you said evangelical or that's kind of your yeah, your background in christianity pentecostal and pentecostal yeah and so uh it was through romeo that you kind of came across orthodoxy yeah, funny enough, even though, like, I grew up in, like, different churches and went there for years, like, it, it never, it never hit until, like, now. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I, one of the things that I talk about and I try to explain on this channel is that orthodoxy is a different beast because it's not just a belief system. It's not just you go to church on Sunday. It's a lifestyle. It's yep. really encompassing. And it is the original faith of the Christian church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. It is the faith that has been laid down by the apostles. And uh, you find it when you really search for truth. You know, scripture talks about tr Christ is the truth. The truth is a who, not a what. And when you start to really, just like you guys uncovering corruption within the military or witnessing things that were going on, or even uh, the sobering reality of being in war, um, that it's the pursuit of truth ultimately it's going to lead you to Jesus Christ. And maybe you, you get in one re reiteration or the other, but uh, then the pursuit of truth continuing is eventually going to bring you to orthodoxy. If you're not satisfied with the sort of emotionalism that Protestantism will give you or the, you know, the corruption of the Catholic church, I think most people who don't grow up in Catholicism, it, it really, there's something that is just from the onset isn't uh, appealing of the Catholic church, but then you, find out this this eastern variation that you you know somehow has been kept a secret um and you enter into the liturgies you start to understand the theology you start to see that this is this is really what we've all been looking for and so it it this is the bottom of the rabbit hole whether you want to go down you want to you, you know want to look into the federal reserve want to look into uh whatever whatever rabbit hole you're interested in looking into the ultimate realization, it only totally makes sense from an orthodox worldview. And that's yeah. what this whole game is. And that's really the state of the world that we're in right now is none of it makes total sense without the, the orthodox lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. You know, that's so true, man. Um, it, you, that's, that's a really good way to put it. And I, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> for me, I just always assumed orthodoxy was Catholicism, right? You know, because th there was uh, the the schism but you don't really hear too much and you just assume because they're like yeah it's the eastern roman empire kind of thing you know like just the way that it was presented you don't know what it is and to me honestly you know in the way i look at things now and especially as i understand with orthodoxy and what has gone on you know there's there's a specific reason as you become a member of the church 
you discover why they try not to talk about it because it is truth. I right. don't know, you know, um, by the grace of God, you know, um, I have been able to expose people to this and just as you have as well. And, uh, um, I don't know how many people have told me just to experience that liturgy the first time you're in there, you know, to really experience the Holy spirit. And there's, there is something because with the, the, what is it? It's the Kairos time. I think that's what it is where yeah. Kairos, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're actually experiencing the crucifixion of Jesus. When you are there, you are taking of the flesh, you are drinking of the blood. And especially when you become a member of the church, because that was the hardest thing. I don't know about you being a catechumen and watching people take communion. Oof, that's painful. <laughs> yeah. you know, when you, <laughs> you, you've got that going on now, don't you doc? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, once you can participate in that, you know, just to get that medicine, right. It's good medicine. It's the medicine that you need. Yeah. Um, and you can you can begin to feel and and doc i'm sure you're already experiencing just by being in the in the grace of the church because uh once you're a catechumen uh you are part of the church uh you know obviously you can't commune yet but once you can commune you and you receive the full holy spirit i mean when you try to when you because we all end up doing things that we were trying to leave uh, whether it is you smoke weed again, or, you know, you get drunk, or you, you know, get around old friends and old habits come about or pornography, whatever it is, um, it, it, it hits you different, you can feel yep. that it just it's totally unsatisfying, in a way that mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, it's kind of hard to comprehend that the, the more you go down this path towards God towards the original church towards the original theology, the more you uh, ingratiate yourself with the uncreated energies of God, nothing else quite satisfies and you can't explain it to somebody. It's only exp an experience you can have, and you can only have that full experience until you make that decision in your heart. It's like a, it's a gut transformation. It, it's a heart yes. transformation. Yes, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's at that point too, when I have gone down, yeah, it's, it's one thing to repent, you know, and, and even for me too, because I was born Roman Catholic, but, you know, I only experienced that really by uh, going to church, like when grandparents were here or, you know, like older family, things like that. It was never something that I did with my family. I attended mostly like non-denominational Christian churches or even a Lutheran church growing up. But to go to confession, because I always looked at confession like, yeah, that's stupid. Why are you confessing to this guy? Obviously, you know, it's something we can talk a little more about, but to go to confession, because I did confession this morning because um, I had church service this morning and right. there is such a feeling because I, I, I'd experienced things, you know, things I had experienced in the military. Uh, and, and even as I got out of it, you know, there were, were some head injuries type stuff. I had some depression, anxiety, things like that I dealt with. And I tried addressing those things through the SSRIs. I tried addressing it through going to psychiatrists, psychologists. Everything that I did on that made me feel worse. The SSRIs right. made me feel worse. I would go to these people and talk to them. And I never felt like I was having an honest conversation with them because they were coming at me with some theory that may or may not be right. But they were trying to apply that theory. You come to God and you experience God and his wholeness, you experience the Trinity, and it's so refreshing, it cleanses you. Yeah. And it's just something that that secular world that they're trying to replace it with, that demonic secular world does not hit. Right, right. Absolutely. Doc, is there anything you want to add to that? No, yeah, it's, it's exactly right. And then even earlier, how you said, like, orthodoxy is like a whole way of life, like, being Protestant, like, most of my life, like, there was always something missing like a, like a, i needed to do more even though i was volunteering helping out with like uh like kids ministry and all kinds of things and i was like okay like there's still something more that like it's just missing and then eventually like once i'm here it's like you do all these things and you realize how much more meaningful they are when you do those things and it just just that in and of itself has got me to another level of uh openness with myself and being able to be more honest and be like okay is what i'm doing worth worth it right now so it's been a complete change of uh mindset to just kind of look at things through that lens you know and be like okay like everything i do i should be doing it for god like i had i knew it before but then now that there's more of a that orthodox way of doing it is like it's 
it makes more sense the more I read into it and the more I see, okay, why this? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? I'm like, okay, so that makes more sense where before they wouldn't explain things. Oh, yep, just do it for God. That's it. And you're just like, okay, <laughs> I, I understand that, but like there, there's always more, but it it definitely helped, helped me change a lot. A lot of the ways that I was doing and a lot of the things that I was doing before and now I just kind of want to keep that up so then that way my family can kind of be coming back to this side as well and it's so funny because my mom just came with us to uh <laughs> she came to us with liturgy and she's uh she's been protestant and she's like this is catholicism i'm like no mom it's different like it's it's kind of the same but they split from us and i was trying to talk theology but i know all, all in good time i'm just gonna keep praying for her but <laughs> yeah well, it was kind of did she end up thinking it was just Catholicism, or yeah, did she get? Yeah, her and I had discussions about it, and then uh, her and I still talk, and like uh, I try to send her as much uh, information, just kind of hey, like look, here's the the difference. But since she's grew, she grew up uh, Roman Catholic, so that's her only vision of how things were. But I, I guess over time, like I, I'm gonna have to, you know, keep watering that seed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in regards to some of the psychedelic stuff, I know, again, you guys are, are streaming live on your guys' end. So just to kind of introduce myself to your guys' audience, um, you know, my name's uh, David Patrick Carey. I got this YouTube channel called Church of Eternal Logos, and I am a PhD candidate at uh, the Graduate Theological Union focusing on the use of drugs within world religious history uh, and looking at the continuation of this process, whether it be from shamanism through the ancient mystery rites, through the traditions of magic, through hashish use and opium use in Sufi Islam, to, um, to Aleister Crowley, to Thelema practice, to Aldous Huxley into the 20th century with the cleansing of the doors of perception, and really focusing on the 1960s counterculture and how the the use of LSD mushrooms, uh, what also that's where DMT started to, to get uh, popularized, is really the emergence of a very ancient ancient uh, religious practice. And so my research looks at the it, it works in the realm of new religious movements and what's called the Western esoteric traditions, the history of ritual magic and magic within the Western civilization. And arguing that the use of psychedelics post the 1960s counterculture is its own new religious movement, and that drugs themselves are a sort of technology, it's a techne, a means to an end for a spiritual experience, and that when we start to look at the state of the world now, and we look at transhumanism, we look at uh, the technological singularity of somebody like Ray Kurzweil, that a lot of this stuff is primed and ready through the, the sort of experience or the spirituality of drugs, specifically psychedelics. And so um, I began my journey, grew up sort of conservative Methodist uh, in Midwest America and in Indiana. And when I got into my undergraduate studies, really got shook the sort of naivete that I had regarding Christianity and what, what exactly that was. And started to get into Eastern mysticism, started to make change my focus of, re, you know, undergraduate, my major from like pre-physical therapy to something like biology um, and then started to take introduction classes to like world religions, uh, was really interested in Taoism, Buddhism and Hinduism, decided that I wanted to go to China, uh, spent uh, three and a half years studying Mandarin and spent two summers in southern China at a university studying Chinese culture. Um, and that led eventually to me realizing that I wanted to pursue a PhD in, in religious studies, uh, looking at world religions and studying world religions. And it was during my junior, senior year of undergraduate that uh, I started to get really deep into people like Terrence McKenna, Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary, and doing very high doses of mushrooms, talking, you know, anywhere between five to eight grams uh, high dose uh, trips on psilocybin mushrooms, uh, lots and lots of LSD trips, and really feeling like that in regards to my studies of world religions and being somebody who's a sort of comparative um, scholar, that this is the leading edge of religion, that all of religion is about these religious experiences, these mystical experiences, as Romeo was talking about, and that, um, you know, you can do it through yoga, you can do it through 
you know, doing Tai Chi on Mudong Mountain, you know, in the morning mist, or you can take these psychedelics and, and it's like a shortcut and you have these very profound experiences. Now we'll get into, especially as an Orthodox perspective, how the validity of these experience can really, really be brought into question. But um, that was where I was during my undergraduate. And I was convinced having gone to Asia, having, uh, having again, tons of psychedelic experiences, studying world religions, that this was what the 21st century was about, is, is the realization that all world religions are really leading to the mystery of psychedelic drugs and psychedelic substances. That led to a master's focus on early Christianity with a very uh, keen interest on what's called Gnosticism, the, which is mm -hmm. a misnomer. It's just a term to describe a, a whole host, a variety of different uh, Christian ideas, teachings, understandings that are contrary to the Orthodox teaching of the church. So Gnosticism isn't just one thing. There's a lot of different traditions that have a lot of different things uh, that they believe, but I was very much interested in the other 48 books regarding who Jesus Christ was. And so that was all found in the 1940s and in, in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, what's referred to as the Nag Hammadi scriptures or the Nag Hammadi library, that there's 48 books about Jesus Christ uh, throughout the first four centuries. And they have very different understandings. We're talking about the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Peter. And um, I was kind of felt like this was the, the true Christianity. This is what Christianity was all about. And that's why the Orthodox Church or these, again, not even a sophisticated understanding of church history, but Christianity was suppressing, you know, the, the Orthodox, whatever that was. I, I wasn't, I didn't know what Orthodox theology was. I kind of had it all characterized under Catholicism or something that uh, they were, the, the whole attempt was to squash out um, all these competing narratives of what Christianity was. And in, in conjunction with studying early Christianity and, and having a keen interest in Gnosticism and what's called Hermeticism, the teachings uh, or writings regarding surrounding a figure called Hermes Trismegistus, which is a very magical uh, humanistic ancient uh, worldview coming out of Egypt. Um, I also studied psychedelic shamanism. And so one of the professors there at the University of Illinois was Native American. And so he allowed me to really focus on classes with him looking at uh, various forms of psychedelic uh, drug induced forms of, na uh, of Native American religions, whether that be um, here in the US looking at peyote cults, looking at the potential use of cannabis or ayahuasca uh, cults down in the Amazon jungle. And that, again, I, I created a previous YouTube channel called Fractal Universe, which was then promoting all the psychedelic stuff. Uh, Terrence McKenna, as I said, the same, same names that I already mentioned, uh, Alan Watts, um, Robert Anton Wilson, all this different stuff. And that led to um, me, again, feeling like I was going to become this religious scholar, this religion scholar, and lead people to the true mystery that if you have enough courage, you can just take drugs and you can find out what uh, religion is really all about. Um, eventually, I got accepted to my PhD program that I'm in now. And that PhD program, my, my initial what I got accepted to study was people who identified as spiritual but not religious. And this is a really large phenomenon, particularly in the Western world. But if you look at Pew Research, and so the Pew Research Center is considered sort of the, the epitome of statistical data. Uh, in the United States and the Western world, that if you, when they do their religious surveys and ask people identify what is their religion, um, the, the most, the majority of people would fill in the section that said none of the above. And this is called, this is now began a group of identified people as what are called nuns, N O N E S, not N U N S, but N O N E S and nuns are none of the above, that they are, they don't belong to any particular religious tradition. And so I was interested as somebody who would identify myself as a nun, somebody who's spiritual but not religious, somebody who's accessing the divine through drugs. I'm curious then what symbols they appropriate. Why the Buddha? Why Ganesha of Hinduism? Why uh, the yin and yang? Why uh, the sort of Christ consciousness uh, interpretations of Christianity? And so that's what I got accepted to do research on. And that first semester, I came across a book called The Psychedelic Gospels, uh, this book right here which then uh, shows fresco evidence of 
what appeared to be um, psychedelic mushrooms and this whole reinterpretation of what the Eucharist was in Christianity as really an inebriating practice of what, and that's how you quote unquote communed with God. That's how you became one with Christ is that you would take these psychedelic substances and that, and so the, the, the wine and the bread, this was all just a sort of uh, a, a misunderstanding. This was, this is what the plebs were given, but the people in the know uh, that it was all about these psychedelic substances. And so uh, in their book, they do show a considerable amount of evidence of psychedelic mushroom portrayal in frescoes in France and Spain and Southern Germany, um, even in, in the Canterbury um, Psalter in England. And that really opened my eyes. And so then I thought, geez, I wonder if all this stuff at the time I was dating a Ukrainian girl and I, she was culturally Eastern Orthodox. And I, and I knew about all the, all the icons and the imagery of Orthodoxy. And I began to think, geez, I wonder if I can, knowing all this stuff and having done some of this research, that if I can find this stuff in Orthodoxy, because all the examples provided in this book called the Psychedelic Gospels are all historically contextualized between the 10 hundreds, the 11th century and the 14th century, the 1300s. And so the, all this stuff kind of appears within a particular period. And, and later in my research, I, you know, I argue now academically that that is because of the resurgence of these Gnostic tradition, these traditions that were actually competing with Orthodox Christianity in the ancient period, that Manichaeanism, a tradition developed by a gentleman named Mani, that they were eating psychedelic mushrooms and that psychedelic practices were common in the ancient Mediterranean. And that when the crusading uh, knights, say, for example, the Knights Templar, the Knights Hospitallers, that or when they went to the Holy Land during the Crusades, that they re-encountered these ancient mysteries. And by re-encountering these ancient mysteries, they brought them back to Western Europe. And there were Gnostic groups, whether it be uh, the uh, the Bogomils or the Paulicinians uh, or the Carpocratians, all these different traditions um, that um, had very uh, different understandings that they were reemerging in Western Europe and through the Inquisition, they were smashed out. Now, I thought, okay, maybe I'll find this stuff in Eastern, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, given that uh, there's a gentleman named R. Gordon Wasson and his wife, Valentina Pavlovna, uh, he kind of reintroduced psychedelic mushrooms and psychedelic shamanism to the Western world uh, during a 1957 article he wrote in Life magazine talking about Maria Sabina and this uh, shamaness down in Mexico and doing all these rituals with her. And so they wrote a book called Mushrooms, Russia and History, talking about the linguistic connections between Slavic cultures, particularly uh, Russian, with uh, the eating of mushrooms, the hunting of mushrooms, and how they have hundreds of words for mushrooms. But in English, we have toadstool, fungus, and mushroom. We really have three words. And so I dove into a class during my, my research, my PhD studies on Eastern Orthodox theology and history. And this was a real transition in my own life. And so diving into that, I came across what I try to promote now on my YouTube channel called Logos Theology. And it's a very sophisticated, uh, deeper, much deeper understanding of who Jesus Christ is and how we understand the entirety of the cosmos, the entirety of the Christian faith, the purpose of the incarnation. And it's way more complex, more sophisticated than you're going to get in your typical Protestant articulation. And so this really resonated with me. Now, at the time, I'm a non-believer. I'm still promoting psychedelics. I'm still smoking weed every day. Um, and the more I read, the more it resonated, the more it made sense, the more dots connected. And this led to eventually coming to the realization probably six months later that I couldn't deny that this deeper theology that I wasn't totally conscientious of within the Orthodox Church, that it was the truth. It made too much sense. And um, this caused me to be a bit conflicted with my old YouTube channel. And that's why I created this new channel called Church of the Eternal Logos, trying to really explain myself to so many people who knew me, knew of my research in the world religions, knew of my habitual use of drugs, of why I wanted to stop that and try to tell people to stop doing that and not go down that rabbit hole. And that actually there's this faith called Orthodox Christianity, and it has everything that you're looking for. And let me just explain to you why the new age or why being spiritual, not religious, or why being an occultic uh, practitioner, why these things are actually just shortcomings, they're misunderstandings, they're self-worship. 
and that we need to stop worshiping ourselves, but we need to start worshiping the Holy Trinity. And that's kind of then the point of my YouTube channel and what I do. And so, um, sorry, that's a long ramble, but Ram Romeo know, and Doc, good. if you guys, if yeah, you guys no, want to. I want to respond to that um, and, and we can get into like the use of psychedelics and experiences with psychedelics and how that uh, how that can you can have positive experiences. For example, Romeo, maybe go into your experience with the use of psychedelics and how uh, they, they do shake you out of a nihilistic uh, atheistic worldview because it, it makes it very clear that we are surrounded by a spiritual reality and the decisions that we make do affect uh they do, they do have causal uh, effect outside space and time um and so uh romeo maybe go into a little bit of your experience with psychedelics sure sure uh, i think first you you touched on something that i thought was uh interesting when you were talking about all the words for mushrooms i spent some time over in eastern europe and you know when you go over there the people that that's just their life they go yep. looking for mushrooms you know like right. mushrooms are such an important thing. And I think what was interesting too, I found out that I think it was in Germany when I, when I spent some time there, like to make beer, you couldn't include mushrooms in there. I don't know if you knew anything about that, but I, I had often wondered when I heard about that, if people were making a hallucinogenic beer at the time or something, and that was something that they had gotten rid of. I don't know if you know anything about that or heard anything on that. I, I mean, I have heard of people using, uh, you know, sort of intoxicating beverages, but it, when we look back to the ancient the mysteries of, say, out the Alicinian mysteries, there's a whole book called The Road to Eleusis, written by R. Gordon Wallace and the gentleman I was talking about, Albert Hoffman, the uh, synthesizer mm -hmm. of the chemist who synthesized LSD, and Carl A.P. Ruck, a famous classicist. And they make the case that the ancient mystery rites of Eleusis, which were world renowned, they were famous in the ancient period, that they drank an intoxicating beverage called the Kekekion, and they believed it was a barley or rye based be uh, beverage. And so mm. when you look at uh, barley and rye potentially being used for uh, hops for for beer, there are ways in which you can actually allow these substances to acquire a, a fungus, a sort of corn smut. Uh, and ergot like substances and, and LSD is a variation of ergot. And so that's uh, where they argue that the ancient world sort of perfected ways to create beverages that have a sort of LSD like effect if you were to drink it. Um, now, some, some a lot of that stuff was kept esoterically, um, but there are instances of it for sure. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so for me, you know, I first I think it was 15 the first time I did LSD. I had no idea what I was getting into. You know, I was sort of like a skater punk kind of kid. Uh -huh. People were talking about one of the guys at school had LSD. And I was just always that kind of person back then, like, hey, okay, I'll try it. So I tripped acid in school the first time I did it, which was the most horrible, frightening thing I'd ever experienced to that point in my life. Because the 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 walls came alive around me, the floors, everything, you know, I was right. seeing things and I couldn't focus at all you know it was one thing if i smoked weed i could still kind of fake it you can't fake it on a, on some, a substance like that right or it's you're a very you're a different person if you can make it and fake it on that you know because it's just you can't focus so i experienced a lot of that and before i was in the military as well i attended art school for a bit and at art school uh, there was a lot of people at school that would go to like the different like dead fish you know, concerts like that, they'd come back with that. And I was always the guy that I would just take a tab, you know, like, hey, let's see what's in this. You know, like I was the experiment guy, which again, not probably the brightest thing that I did, but I did it. So there's that. But then I got away from it for a while because I, I experienced, I think, um, and one of the things I look back on it now is it, what really, not that I would want to do that now, However, back then, I don't think, especially with maturity, your frontal lobe isn't developed. And I think that you get right. washed with so many emotions when you're doing that stuff. Because, you know, it's just that, uh, that roller coaster, as I yep. describe it for people, you know, and experiencing that where you've got your, your body feels these different sensations, but then also at the same time, too, the way you're cycling through a lot of thoughts and things like that. It's very, very difficult to process. So I'd gotten away from that for quite some time. However, um, I got involved with a lot of veterans. Um, I was living in Colorado for a while. And once they had legalized the marijuana, there was a lot of guys with PTSD. 
and these were guys, you know, they would, I, I remember one guy, he showed up because I just, I'd bring people out there and uh, the guy, like he came to my door and he was just standing like his fist. And it wasn't like he was going to punch me. It's just, this guy was so wound up with so much PTSD, anger and things like that. You know, we went and grabbed some dinner and he was just slamming vodka. Um, and then um, I, you know, back then I was like, Hey man, all right, well, you know, he hadn't really tried marijuana and I got him high and that was able to bring him out of it. And mm -hmm. so that was kind of the path where I took so that I was doing that. And then I started getting back into doing the mushrooms and you know, for me too, as well, as I was trying to help other people, I was also trying to fix myself. And it was kind of one of those things like, hey, I'm finding this out. You know, there's a network of vets. We're sharing this information. We're seeing a lot of positive effects because so many guys, they get out they're They're so messed up with uh, PTSD, head injuries, a lot of things like that. They're trying to find some way that's going to help. And the, you know, as I spoke of for myself, and you see it with a lot of other guys, you're just being fed a lot of these medications. You're told they're supposed to help you, but in fact, they make you feel worse and they cause right. side effects where you need to take more medication, more medication. So I was trying to go down a natural route, you know, and it's also like, that's when I was also exploring a lot of like paleo diet, maybe some more ketogenic carnivore type things, things like, like that, you know, like what is it that's actually helping us to heal? And so I was trying to just, and even now I still share a lot of those things with people, right. but right. In that process, I was also, I couldn't shake some of that depression and anxiety that was just sort of a, uh, a black cloud, you know, yeah. for, for lack of a better reason, that was everywhere I went, it was there. Some days worse than other days. You know, I, I've suffered like 10 concussions in my life. Oh. There was aspects of that, that I think caused some of this, but I think also realistically looking at it now from the perspective from the orthodoxy, it was a lot of the degenerate things that I was doing. I was feeding that cycle, uh, just a, that demonic, you know, evil cycle where, right. yes, I got some pleasure, I guess, you right. know, uh, you know, out of it. But realistically, it was just, it was that maelstrom that was just pulling me down further and further, that whirlpool where it was just sucking me in. So when I started doing the hallucinogens, I saw what I was doing. Like I could see the blueprint of, okay, these are the things I was doing. I, that helped me to break the cycle of a lot of those things I was doing, because that's what I think so many people have such a hard time with psychologically is you're just doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. The definition right. of identity, right? Right. Yep. Um, and by doing the hallucinogens, it allows you you take a step back and even, I don't want to say it's necessarily the curious time, but time is much different. You right. get such a different perspective on yourself, the world reality, and it helps to, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of taking a red pill. You've entered the matrix yeah. at that point. You're seeing the, the screen that Cypher was seen in the matrix, you know, like you can see the, yep. what people do. Cause you even think about like interactions, like you, you feel that interaction of, okay, you know, the conversation is going to go this way. You know, like there's so many different things. You start to see that, that framework. And so it was helping me to uncover that. And it helped me to break down a lot of the negative things that I was doing. And there are a lot of vets that I know if they hadn't had the hallucinogens and hadn't had the weed, yeah. they would have blown their own heads off right. without a doubt, you know, because the, everything that was being fed to them from the uh the va system and everything like that was only making them worse you know and that's why i i i i know that this is something that's very dangerous and i know it's not something to play with i know that you're taking these shortcuts to things like that um it, with my concern with vets i don't know how many guys i can just be like hey come to church with me because there's a lot right. of guys who can't get that you right. know and that's what that that's where my that's where I have a difficult times with this because if you take your life, you're not getting into heaven. You're not right. getting into heaven, you know, cause it's like with Orthodox church, you don't get an Orthodox funeral if you take your own life. Right. You know? Right. And so that's, that's the challenge that I find myself with this. Uh, I can't go a hundred percent condemning because I know I've seen guys that it's, it's, it's saved them. And I don't know that I would have found Orthodoxy if I hadn't done this. Right. That's where, you know, the, the rub. Well, let me speak to that for a second, because one of the things that I always talk about and even 
uh, you know, reiterate the same message that somebody like Terrence McKenna would always talk about is that psychedelics dissolve boundaries. And this can be uh, a good thing in regards to, for example, people with PTSD. I know somebody mentioned uh, the VA uh, opening up the possibility of, of uh, psychedelic substances being used for PTSD, because if you have PTSD, you're reliving a trauma-based experience. And so by getting into a state of an altered state of consciousness through these drugs, you will uh, dissolve the boundaries of which the, you're repeating a certain experience over and over again. And maybe, yeah. again, if you are deep into alcoholism and you get high on LSD, maybe you will see the damage that you're causing yourself. You're transcending boundaries. You're dissolving conceptual boundaries, identity boundaries. That's why people, they get high on psychedelics, say, you know, we're all one. They have this phenomenological experience of unity. At the same time, this this psychedelic experience is what's happening to our to the world at large. The, the dissolution of gender boundaries, the dissolution mm -hmm. of national boundaries, the dissolution of, of co cognitive boundaries like truth, it, it, for example, everybody relativism, everybody has their own truth. And so I do know that people I know personally have also used psychedelics and had positive experiences to break free from habitual patterns. Um, and so I Iboga, for example, a, a drug used over in, in tribal Africa has been uh, is is has shown great rates with with heroin addicts. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to navigate these murky waters where, um, you know, some of these substances may be better options for people than any of the big pharma pharmaceuticals, which actually trying to make you dependent and create a, a revenue stream off your own illness. Um, at the same time, the other flip side of this dissolution of boundaries is that it does open you up to a spiritual reality that is absolutely real. And mm -hmm. so orthodoxy has a Russian term called prelest mm -hmm. and prelest is spiritual delusion. And so as you get into the, as you, as you use psychedelic substances, as you use drugs, you are opened up to a real reality and it absolutely feels real. It looks real. It, it feels real when you come down from them. But the, the insights that we think we have, uh, we can't just base everything to be true based on, well, I experienced this and therefore it must be true. And this is what sure. the church says leads people to what's called spiritual delusion, that, yep. that the orthodoxy teaches that the spiritual warfare is in your mind. Where is your mind? Where is your imagination? Where does it exist? And it's there that all the temptations, all the trauma, you know, that we experience in the world, it's, it's residing in this imaginative space. And that's where we're being tempted. That's where we're encountering the demons. But it's not so much, you know, you're walking down the street and, you know, that, that the devil's going to encounter you face to face. That's not sure. necessarily the spiritual warfare. The spiritual warfare is in your mind. And, um, and so these psychedelics then... Um, it, it's hard to discuss, uh, because you, you need to be sophisticated. You need to be nuanced about this. They do help people at the same time, whenever you go into those altered states, you're opening yourself up yes. to potential possession, to potential delusion, to potential spiritual ramifications that you're not totally aware of in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and you know, and, and that's the thing too, is obviously if there is this type of thing to be used, it's got to be a very controlled environment of it. You know, it's just, it, I prefer it to what I've seen a lot of guys go through. And I mean, Doc, you know, what have you seen, you know, from the military side there too, with like some of the the different people? Because you see it. I mean, I don't, I mean, are, are they prescribing like the SSRIs to active duty dudes now? Yeah. And actually, uh, before I jump into that, it's funny enough that you said that um, doing a lot of this stuff does open up doors because, um, uh, I had an experience, and this was, like, prior to the military, and, like, me still knowing, like, knowledge about, like, God, even though I was going to Protestant churches during that time, um, I was, uh, I think ecstasy was, like, the, the choice, at least for me, and just, the, it was doing it for months on end, weekdays, weekends, like, you, you name it, and I remember one of the times where I finally d kind of decided to try to cold turkey, I was coming down like pretty hard and then like I remember I, f I fell asleep and I thought I fell asleep or, or you know at least it felt like it and I was having this vivid dream like highly vivid and then um, I was telling Romeo about it the other day but uh, 
where I was inside a house and like everyone was like scared and you I could see like friends but I didn't know them like I could recognize their faces but then they were like hey don't go outside like he's gonna get you and I'm like who and then they're like he's out there and I'm like all right whatever so I go outside the house and there's like a porch but everything's like pitch dark and then I remember I'm like trying to look but I can't see anything except the small amount of light behind me and then like a, a shadowy dark figure comes up like right in front of me and he's talking to me and I could hear it so like clearly and he was like I'm gonna go in there I'm gonna take your friend and I'm gonna kill all of them and then in my head I'm just like no you're not gonna go in there and then as he's trying to get past me I'm holding him with my right hand and then I wake up and I'm still like I feel this figure still in my hand and then I was praying and I didn't even know it and then afterwards like I just continued praying and afterwards it disappeared and I was like dude what was that and like I and then I can't realize like yo like uh, all this stuff that I'm doing is leading me down into this road that it does open doors and you're just like okay yeah. I should know better and it, from there I kind of cleaned up and then I was like yeah I can't be doing this stuff anymore like this is just leading me down a path that I just <laughs> I obviously don't want because it's it's inviting things and spirits and demons that just I, I'd rather not deal with. And then I, I cleaned up, I relapsed and then cleaned up again. And then, but uh, yeah, th that, that door I'd rather just not open for me personally. Although some people are like, Oh, Hey doc, you know, let's go do this thing. And I'm like, no nah, brother, I'm, I'm good. You guys should probably reconsider. Right. Uh, but with SSRIs, yeah, um, they try to not, but it depends on case by case. But most people that I know they are on them. And it, it just really varies on the provider wise on what they think. And if you're seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist, since only one of them can actually give you medication, I can't yeah. remember which one. So, but it, it, it's really based on. Oh, so you, it's not just a, it's not just like a GP in the military. It's going to be somebody like a psychiatrist or a psychologist that's going to actually do the prescribing. Yeah. You, you, okay. you have to do that's some good. meetings and then it's from then they decide, but then. Some people don't like going as well for the same reasons because it's, sure. it's kind of sad, but then it hinders part of their uh, military career or they want to still do other things and deploy. But then it's like, what's more important, man, your life or, you know, this momentary thing of being in the military? Right. You know, that's interesting. You, you talked about that and it reminded me, you know, there was an experience. And I think one of the reasons when I was younger, when, when I stopped doing the LSD, when I was doing it all the time. There was a day where I was sitting in my room and um, it was down there. It was in art school. And uh, I started seeing like a, a tree building on the floor. Like it started at my feet and it started going out away from my feet up towards the ceiling. And what I was seeing was in this tree, I saw objects of my life and how I was interacting with people, all these pieces coming together and it was building up and then it would turn into this bright light as it got up close and it would hit me in the head. Wow. And that scared the hell out of me. What I experienced at that point, because I was feeling all of these different things coming together and I was building it all up. It all made sense to me, but it was also so much information that I was taking in at that moment that that was one of the reasons why I'd stopped back then, because it was such an all powerful moment and i knew that i was experiencing things and i couldn't process it and it seemed like it was um you know it was knowledge that i wasn't supposed to have but i was touching into it and right. it just scared the life out of me right no absolutely and that's part of that's why psychedelics are beneficial to you know if you're an atheist or, or nihilist it's pretty hard to take high dose psychedelic substances have these experiences and not believe in a spiritual reality um, and so it, it, it's very, and then the, the effects psychedelics can have on people, you know, I see myself, I look at my own life and I see how I was spiritually deluded, but at the same time, the last two psychedelic trips that I, I took in 2018 and then one at an ayahuasca ceremony in 2019, um, both of them basically forced me moved me into the direction of doing what i am right now uh in 2018 having kind of felt like this orthodox stuff after i had dove into it i was a non-believer i basically knew the theology pretty darn well because i had read i did a whole semester just reading the the important theologians contemporary and even patristic stuff that it's like i could i could if, if orthodox christianity was like a like a uh 
uh, an estate. I had walked around the entire perimeter of the estate. I've seen the whole thing. Now, I did not enter into it. I was not a believer, but I knew the framework of the whole thing. And so I did a high dose LSD experience. And when I did that, um, all the stuff that I had learned regarding Orthodox theologies just clicked into place with the experiences that I'd had on psychedelics. So this idea that I was becoming God or that psychedelics and this Gnostic sort of gnosis, the secret knowledge that you kind of have access to, as you're talking about, um, it, 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 the impression, if you're outside of any traditional framework, is that you're being divinized, that you're moving closer towards divinity. And um, I connected that with the orthodox teaching of theosis, that the whole point of the mm -hmm. incarnation of God was to build a bridge of being totally human, full human essence, full mm -hmm. hum, uh, God essence, divine essence, connected in a singular person, allowing us divinizing uh, the, uh, the ability for us to be divinized through the engagement of his uncreated energies. He, you know, Christ is the bridge that we cross over into divine nature by grace. It's only by following Christ is teaching. It's only by following his patterns. It's only by following the word, the logos incarnate that we can participate in the reality of the Holy Trinity and seeing that, um, that this made a lot of sense regarding these apotheosis understandings that psychedelics provided. Psychedelics also provide this understanding that we're all one, that, that we're all united. Um, and, but I connected that with how orthodoxy does not annihilate the unique understanding of the person, that the person is special. It's made in the image of God. And that if you want to show love to the world, you can only show love to another person. You can't love these abstractions. You can't love social justice. You can't love the world. The only things that you can love are things that can love you back. The only way you can show mercy and compassion are other things made in the image of God. And so realizing that this all oneness is Christ teaching to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. that, that is the ultimate understanding. If we all are one to a degree, if we all are created beings in the image of God, that is the teaching. Uh, looking at sacred geometry and fractals and, and Fibonacci sequences. Uh, well, it's like, well, nature has these divine patterns, but they only make sense. How do they exist? If everything's just the the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago and everything's just moving together haphazardly and just trying to occupy different niches, it doesn't make sense that there's a there's a divine order, there's a metaphysical framework for creation itself. That's why Plato, even in his idea of the divine forms, said that it's all rooted in the logos. Now his logos was a demiurge, but yeah. it, but it's the logos, it's that which incre it, which incarnated as Jesus Christ is where all archetypes, whether you're interested in Jordan Peterson or or Jung, where are these things rooted? Why are they objectively real and yet at the same time they're non-physical? And so you start to see how all these things that people love about the new age or about occultism, it's actually just subtle, subtle distortions that take you off into a totally different area that leads you away from the, the, the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, which is the Orthodox framework, the Orthodox church, the original teaching of Christianity. Well, and I think that you touched on something that, you know, uh, along the way there was Peterson that I, I actually experienced. And, you know, I, I was... It, at the time, he definitely, like, as I was looking at the world around, he was one of the people who was speaking truth to that. But, you know, it was interesting because you did a whole uh, episode talking about his daughter and yeah. how she's come over to Christianity. And that's been a very interesting, I'm really glad that you did that episode because I had no idea because I've kind of stepped away from him. But to see that and then see his response to that, you talk, you touched on Young there as well. That was one of those things that I first got into, and you could see a lot of patterns that Young was able to identify. Right. And that was a, another thing that I was like, okay, there is a lot more here. But I think most importantly, outside of the demiurge, but logos, that's something that before we started talking here, but there, that's the name of your channel here. And that was something before I became Orthodox that I didn't understand the logos because, you know, in the beginning was the word. That's what we were taught in English, but in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God. The Logos was God. The Logos was light. The Logos was order. Yeah. And everything that we are experiencing in this world is the rejection of that Logos. We're rejecting yes. truth. We're rejecting order, and that's the nihilism, the chaos. 
so many people are experiencing. And that's one of the challenges that I find with so much of the Western teaching of Christianity, especially when you've got people who you, you see it and you've experienced it, I'm sure, where people just like, yeah, you know, just open up the Bible, go ahead and read that there. Now, what does that mean to you? You know, without sort of that, that's the framework of orthodoxy, which got me interested. You've got these church fathers who spent so much time understanding and interpreting these words of the Bible and what they actually meant versus, I mean, because that was, you know, before, when I was a teenager, I got into Youth for Christ for a while. And I got involved with uh, a group of these Christian kids. And we used to go and perform and do like these little clown performances. It was really weird. And I felt uncomfortable, but it was like, okay, cool. You know, like I thought I was doing something Christian, but they had me just, you know, like, okay, now read this Bible quote and tell everybody what you think. And it's for, in front of a group of a, a couple hundred people. And I was like, this just doesn't write. I don't know what this means. I can't just at that point, yes, you have the Holy Spirit who can help guide you. But at the same time too, so much of this Western Christianity, I feel like is just a perpetuation of the nihilism that we experience. And I think sometimes lacking that full understanding of what the words meant, whether it was in Greek, whether it was in Aramaic, Hebrew, whatever it was back right. then, there's so much more to these words that people don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah. A lot of and, lost in translation when it comes to a lot of those words. And, and funny enough that you mentioned something like that, because uh, the old church that I was going to, they would, I started doing the same thing, looking into the definitions of things. I'm like, no, it doesn't, something doesn't sound right. And then, yeah, same thing. You look at it and you're like, okay, that's the actual definition. Okay. It makes more sense that way. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why then orthodoxy, you need the tradition that's led by the Holy Spirit to interpret it. You know, one of the, the big contradictions in Protestantism is, of course, they have their, their solas, sola fide, sola scriptura, yeah. sola gratia, all these different things. But so they, they accept the validity in the Holy Spirit uh, validating and choosing which books to put into scripture as opposed to all the different Gnostic texts. But then they reject the tradition that did that as a tradition of men. And yeah, so which yeah, one yeah. is it? It, it, it did, Were they led by the Holy Spirit to put the, the Bible together, of which the Orthodox Study Bible has 79 books and the Protestant Bible has 66? So then who, who's the tradition of men? We had You had men decide to take out 13 books. Like, what were you talking about? And so Protestantism has this fundamental contradiction where, okay, we, we only believe what is Scripture. But is that in scripture? Because when I read scripture, I see the high priest. I see the reference back to tradition. I, I see the understanding of the church. And every, the, you know, look at the epistles. It's all about the church. Well, that mm -hmm. church still exists. Mm -hmm. And th this whole idea that everybody can be their own pope, you're, mm -hmm. you never, you never, yeah, you broke away from the Catholic church, but now every little church just became its own form of the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's it, the, the same pattern has repeated itself at infinitum. And so now, yeah, they believe in all these sola fides, uh, you know, all these solas. And, and yet at the same time, where are all the, the female pastors? What tradition are they in? What, where is all the, the LGBTQ stuff that's penetrating the church and, and subverting the original faith? Where is all that stuff? You know, what tradition is most embodying all that stuff? And it's Protestantism, because it's just ultimately a worship of oneself and a worship of one's own interpretation of something that is totally divorced from the context of history and how it came about. Well, and, and, and I, I wonder too, as well, you run into this quite often where, let's just go solo scriptura. So if we're solo scriptura, how do you explain a rejection of John 6, especially John 6, 6, 6, where he talks about how the, the people, the disciples, the apostles left him because they couldn't accept what he was saying. You are going to be consuming his body. You are going to be experiencing these things. Yeah, what was that? that from the time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him because what he was saying about consuming that. And these people in a lot of these churches, so your solo scriptura and everything there is true in the word of God, but you don't think that you're actually consuming God at that point. And you don't right. bother to even do that in some places. Right. It just, it blows me away, man. Right. Well, it, it, but you have to have this again, just like you guys, your, your guys' testimony 
uh, hits on this point of this transition in the heart and ultimately looking for truth. That's the only way that you can even approach orthodoxy, see what we're talking about and actually approach appreciated it and realize, well, this is the truth. This must be what I'm looking for. Cause a lot of people, unfortunately that, you know, both on my side and your guys' side, they're going to hear us talking and they're going to be extremely dismissive of us trying to talk about this Orthodox Christianity or this, this one true church or, or putting away a lot of the, the things that feed our, our hedonism or these really sensual pleasures uh, because it, it's all about the heart. And, and that's why orthodoxy has the, it's a different anthropology. We're not just a mind, a body and a soul, a mind that's totally divorced. It's totally, you know, all these three structures are somehow totally separate from each other. Orthodoxy brings all these things together and that the mind is actually called the noose. It's, it's the mm -hmm. old Greek word that um, that the uh, that Plato used and a lot of the ancient Greek philosophers, but the noose isn't just this mind, this noetic, uh, rational faculty divorced from your body. It's actually what we call the eye of the heart or the eye of the soul. Mm -hmm. And so your news, the rational component of yourself is tied to your morality. So the ways in which you live your life dictate how much you can see. And so if you're living an, an amoral life, if you're an immoral life, if you're engaging in what we would consider a lot of sin, you're literally darking the noetic faculty in which you look at the world. And so you can't actually see God, this logos that we're talking about, this correct order, this correct discipline, uh, the, the truth, mercy, love, honor. Well, you, you, be, you can't even see it. You can't understand it. And, and so you're filled with darkness. You're darkening mm -hmm. the aspect which allows you to see the world correctly. And so when we look at the state of the world right now and why so many people are slaves and zombies and, and totally bought into propaganda, why is it? Why is it that the, the pornography and, and the hedonism and the multiplicity of genders and, and the, the apps trying to get people laid, the, all this stuff is, whether you're conscientious of it or not, you're darkening the faculty of your noetic apparatus. And by definition, you're going to help perpetuate the rising of the Antichrist. Now, whether, now again, I know some people are going to hear that and be like, whoa, this dude's way radical. <laughs> but uh, it's ultimately the, the truth. The whole idea of history is that people are going to have to make a, a person, individual choice, whether they're going to follow this logos, this, this ordered lifestyle, or reject it. And by an orthodox teaching, the rejection of the logos is only going to allow people to become minions of something that is way beyond themselves whether they're conscientious of it or not it doesn't matter it's not like you well, go ahead go ahead no i was just saying isn't that sort of one of the interesting contradictions of the things that we're seeing now as it comes to especially since the um the coup fit um since all of that kicked off you have actually seen an embracing of a secular religion whether it's the worshiping of the, the St. George that they've got now, and even um, the rituals that they go through, whether it's the mask that they're wearing, whether, um, and so many of these things, that's something too I'd like to, 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 to go to, the, the psychology of that, because whereas it, you, you're talking about with the theosis and where we're coming together with God, and um, you know God is becoming a part of us, and we in essence, I mean, we're going to judge angels, you know, at right. some point, you know, it, it, well, hopefully we'll judge angels. We, I don't operate from the standpoint of, Hey, I'm saved. You know right. what I mean? Like, Absolutely. man, I hope I'm doing it right. You know, yeah. orthodoxy <laughs> well, teaches us to never assume our, our salvation. And that's what keeps us humble. And that's what actually brings us closer to God, the humility. That's why Christ hung out with the lowliest. When God was incarnate as man, he showed us he's not a military leader. He's not a political leader that when Christ is here, he is with the lowliest of people that it literally is through humility that was somehow the, the lowest are elevated to the highest that that mm -hmm. being humble and never assuming your salvation is the only way that you, in a sense, make sure that you're moving in the right direction. First is last and last is first. Right. You know, and, and that's the thing, too, because there's. Um... Was it in Luke? I'm trying to remember where they're, they're walking after Jesus was crucified and they're on the road. And then um, Jesus approaches them because it's yeah. the road that's part of Maccabees. Um, you know, that was where the big revolution was. And they were talking about how 
um, they they were disappointed, right? You know, and 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 they don't recognize the Lord at that point, and they're like, you know, he asks them, "What are you talking about?" And you you don't know, you know, and they're basically they felt like in certain ways that Christ was the failure, the way that they were talking about that, because they were looking to him to be this political leader, this military leader exactly. who was going to give them strength and everything like that. But that's not what he's about. I mean, he's he is the king of kings, but he's not trying to be the king of this world. Right. And it's because how do we fight this spiritual war? You see, as soon as you decide that you're going to, uh, that it's going to become, you know, you're going to become Patriot Front. Well, <laughs> well, once you do that, you know, you, you're, you've already bought into, you're fighting evil with the mechanisms of evil. The only way to fight against it is through the free will, which you're made in the image of. Only God has free will. We are made in the image of God. Therefore, we have free will. The animals don't have the same rational free will that we have to choose to be like Christ. And by doing that and by being merciful and compassionate and humble, that we, we can't lose then. You see, that's the whole game. This whole game is ultimately for your soul. This whole mm -hmm. game is for, this is a spiritual war. And so the way that you win is to become so humble and so righteous and pious that we all struggle with because we're all sinning every single day that you make sure that you're trying to stay on this path. Because if you are, you win. How could you lose this idea? Of, again, for those listening who have never heard about orthodoxy or orthodox theology, there's a unique doctrine that is nowhere else in world religions. It's called the energy essence distinction, that nowhere in world religions is there an understanding that the ways in which how we understand the Godhead is that the Godhead is singular in essence. Essence, uh, it is divine, that when uh, that, that there's one essence and three persons, and that we don't engage with God's essence. This was a big problem with Catholicism. And, and for those who want to dive into what's called Thomistic theology, they don't have the energies. Orthodoxy says the ways in which we engage with God is through energies. And so the ways in which anybody listening to this podcast or is coming to know who I am, they don't know who David Patrick Harry is in essence, but they hear the tonation of my voice. They hear the language I use. They may be watching how I move my hands in the video. This is, these are all energetic properties. So through the energies that I am putting forth through my own personhood, you then as a person watching and experiencing and receiving those energies begins to realize and see who I am. That is the same way that we understand the three persons of the Holy Trinity and how we come to know who God is, that orthodoxy teaches that there are energies of God that are uncreated. They existed before creation. These are energies like truth, like logic, logic of which the root word for logic is logos, like rationality, like mercy, like compassion, like honor. These things, it pre-existed creation because it's through these positive energies that we come to know who God is. And so our worldview as Orthodox is not that good and evil are battling itself out and that the good's going to win just barely in the end. That's not, that, that would insinuate that, that evil is, has a positive reality. Orthodoxy does not teach that. Gnosticism would teach that. Aspects of Protestantism teaches that. Orthodoxy says that the absence of God's energy is a negative existence, the same way in which the laws of thermodynamics exist. Cold is a term describing the absence of heat. Heat is an energy. And so the absence of that energy has a term called cold, but cold has what we would call a negative existence. The same thing with a shadow. A shadow is the absence of light. Light is an energetic process. So the absence of that energy is what we would call darkness, a shadow. But those things don't have a positive existence. They can only exist in the absence of that which exists eternally, those uncreated energies. And so we then, are, are through our free will, are choosing to engage with the energies of God every single day. And that is the process of theosis. That's how we become synergized. We are filled with those energies of which are uncreated. And that's how we as created entities being filled with energies that are uncreated can become closer and closer and more like God. That is the process of theosis. That is how we come to know God. That is how we cleanse our noose. That is how we save. We are saved through these energies of which, again, the incarnation of that logos fuses fully human nature and divine nature into one person. And so through Christ, we can cross that bridge by grace into that which is uncreated. And so if you're filled with the uncreated energies of God, how could you die when you die? 
You can't, you're filled with something that is uncreated and eternal. But if you're filled with lies and you're filled with darkness and you're filled with sin, how could you exist after death? You're filled with something that only has a negative existence, that which in a free, through your free will, you chose the opposite of. Well, and I think that's too, you know, like I had to actually confront because it was that absence of God in recognizing that, that there was no truth. And again, it was one of those things that's so important in, in why, you know, especially um, the blessed Seraphim Rose, uh, hopefully this year he will get sainthood. There's people saying that, you know, the 30 year anniversary that perhaps, or is it the 40 year? it's the 40 year, isn't it? Yeah, 40 year, that he may get his sainthood. But this was a guy who, for those that don't know, he was a, uh, like a beatnik kind of early hippie in San Francisco that was involved um, with a lot of these Eastern philosophies, but he was living a degenerate life out there in San Francisco. And it was him actually walking into, and, and I don't know how many times you hear this type of thing from people, you go into and you actually experience an Orthodox church it's I, I've never felt it in another church, you know, right. and it's it's that sort of you can't describe it rationally. You can only that's your noose again at that point. There's that level of you're communicating with the logos, you're communicating with the truth, the order, and you know it's right. And I know that that sounds insane to people who have accepted this complete rational renaissance view of the world, but that rationality really in a lot of ways, I feel like is just demonic at this point because it has drifted us away from the ability to see this so that we keep trying to, you fragmented it more and more away so that you're not able to communicate with that. And that's really, I think, one of the dangers. And I think that that as well is what we're, we're seeing in the world around us. And I think that, you know, you had done that, that episode that you did with the masks and if you wouldn't mind, kind of, I, I don't know if you could do an elevator yeah. pitch to the audience here. And there's a whole episode for the people who follow us to check out. And I'll, I'll put a link to that. Yeah. So I, I did an, a, a stream talking about the religious use of masks. What do masks mean? Uh, how are they used in a tribal context? What, how are they used in, in shamanism? What, how are they used in uh, historical slavery? And masks are a aspect of a transition point. So when if masks are used in a ritual, the point of the ritual and the use of masks is to um, to establish a transition point of who you once were into who you're going to become. And so this was very common within tribal societies that when you put on the mask, uh, whether again, even in a, a tribal society of, of an animal, that you would become that animal. And often initiation rituals were always tied to the wearing of some type of mask. And so without, with, you know, without getting into many details and being very vague about uh, how this would obviously relate to the current time, that the, the putting on something that obfuscates the image of God, the face, the face, this is unique. Everybody has a unique face. And so when you cover that up and you obfuscate it, you're covering up the identity of who you authentically are made by God. You didn't make that face. I didn't make that face, but we can all make masks. And so masks are ways in which man can create a sort of new identity. And masks are ways, again, that we transition from one point to another. And so as we look at the state of the world right now, I think it's, it's quite clear to see that this has nothing to do with larger premises of health. This has everything to do with a larger ritual. This is, has to do with a changing of the way people understand themselves and how they relate to other people. This is a massive ritual at scale. And this is a tribal understanding. This is uh, moving people to the understanding. Uh, and what, what do the masks symbolize? The one, you know, often masks that are being uh, promoted right now emphasize things that are used for sickness. Um, surgical masks are used for face diapers, that if you are a medical doctor and you're performing open surgery, you put a, a surgical mask on to prevent contamination of that surgical site. It, it's a face diaper. It, it stops things from coming out of your mouth and, and contaminating a surgical site. So uh, by participating in, in a rational ritual, of covering up one's face, 
this is engage and ingratiating people to become servant to you know servants to illogical behavior which is part of the new identity which is a transition this is the new normal this is the great reset this is you moving from who you once were into the person that you're now becoming this is the global citizen and a global citizen has no unique identity the global citizen is an atomic is it's an atomatic i mean it's a it's a atomic person anybody can be filled in with that global citizen doesn't matter your, your ethnicity doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, all that stuff's irrelevant. You're all going to be servants to the same central structure. And this is what's happening in, in the psychological process and the large ritual that is occurring at scale is that people are losing their unique identity in, into tr transitioning themselves into a new identity where they give all their critical thinking skills away they, 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 it's now they allow the state, they allow a centralized system to think for them. And that's what makes them a good citizen. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at masks uh, ritualistically, and if you want to hear more details about how we can understand these things in the history of world religions, um, you know, I have a stream on that. If you just search Church of the Eternal Logos, uh, maybe tribal mask or mask uh, that that might come up. But, yeah, I just um, masked. I was able to refine it. Okay, yeah. Because well, I'd shared it with Doc here as well because yeah. i think that i think that that is one of the things for me too i mean it was really challenging when a lot of this first went down because i didn't understand how the the churches were somehow deciding at this point that i mean the fact that churches shut down never in the history of the orthodox church have people shut down because even when you had the the plague right in um you know byzantium they they were stacking bodies in the churches and they were still having church service Right. But yet now this is this is happening. And what is what is interesting and somewhat frightening, you know, is just seeing how willingly people go along with it. They're they're accepting because we know it, it's lies that get fed out and change just daily, depending upon whatever way they they're kind of pushing people at it. It's one of those things you imagine there's just these these just evil demonic people sitting in a dark room and they're just like, let's see if we can get them to do this today kind of a thing. You know, it's right. it's it's you almost want to laugh at it because it is so ugly. What were you saying? Yeah, it's so unbelievable. No, but yeah, this whole thing. But it's, it's hard to kind of interject. But it's the other thing that you're mentioning about everyone kind of being automatron and just being like a thing. That's literally what is happening with the military as well, where like myself, as, along with Romy and other people are calling it out. It's just like they they don't want people to think like on their own. It's like, hey, do as you're told, where uh, there's a whole lot of us that are refusing to abide by this madness. And you made a good point in your video on that one as well. It's like the minute you don't abide, you stand out where instead of being safe and being one with the herd, now you're on your own and a lot of us have been singled out now and we're we're in the process of getting removed because hey you're not doing as you're told you know just do it and things will be fine but it's like no this logically and like just religiously speaking and just it does not make any sense for right. anyone that actually looks at it logically wise so it's it's funny that you kind of mentioned that as well and then just the manner in which the military has always kind of been that way it's like hey you're nothing but a number you do your job whatever but now it, it's become more apparent even to myself and i always used to joke around about it it's like hey i'm nothing but a number and we all get like a, a dod id and that's usually what I, what I tell people as a joke but now it's just like it no that's the actual reality if you don't do what you're told you're gonna stand out and then you're gonna get removed and that's all they want people to just follow in suit right well and, and the thing was too there was the the lawful orders and that just with, with the eua that's going on with the the jibber jabbers that they've got out there um there is no reason what is being put in these people should be put in the people because it's not matched up to what they agreed to put in there right. because the specific substance that should be used is not even available and on the market but yet we're just supposed to go along with it and you, and you do that you must do this to show that you're a member of the tribe right. and you know a lot of people now there are people who are standing up, but there's a lot of people and I get messages all the time, you know, from people that they're suffering right now because they're getting kicked out. And these are guys with like 17, 18 years oh. in service. 
you know, and they were planning on retiring. They've, they've given so much through this entire global war on whatever it was, you know, um, that we had going on for the military industrial complex. But um, even as they, they, they realized at times there were things we shouldn't be doing there. Now it's reached that point because your choice is between essentially something that's going to bring harm to you potentially or getting out. And so they're having to start their lives over, particularly in a world now too, where if in, you know, in, in Europe and um, Australia, New Zealand, places like that, if you don't go along with that in many places, you can't even be an, an active member of society. And they're doing that in specific cities and some states in this country as well. And you, were you at Berkeley before? Yeah. So in, I'm intrigued by that. And I don't remember exactly the story. But there was something with the Skittles people out there that created a problem for you, wasn't it? Because that's one of the things I think for a lot of us in the military, as we see now, is they're really trying to push that, especially with this transhumanist agenda. And they're essentially transitioning people in the military. The military is paying for it. And that's going to be like two to three years that they're going to be going through this before they can even become a, a valid member of the service. Yeah. What really opened my eyes, because I was, again, I, I thought I was a sort of progressive promoting psychedelics, all that different stuff was when I saw people publicly advocating for what is now called minor attractive persons, um, I, it really shook me awake to see that this was something that professors were saying, uh, other classmates were saying. There were being parades. People were protesting in favor of this stuff in the streets along. Wait, with, wait, they were they were protesting in favor. Well, they were they, they were protests? signs that were when they did a I think it was the pride pride parade um, that when I saw that this stuff was part of it, um, it really puts a new framework for that whole enterprise um, and and. and and where there is, again, it's a total dissolution of boundaries. It's, it's well, we just want to be married. Well, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden that boundary, the, it just keeps moving and moving and moving and really uh, dissolving until there is no boundary. And that's where we're at now. And when I saw that in 2018, 2017, 18, um, it was shocking. I couldn't believe that people I thought were somewhat rational would be in favor of this. And, um, and, and, and so that really woke me in a way that pursued the opposite direction a little bit more fervently with eyes a little bit more open. Um, so my eyes were certainly wide shut, uh, as the, the, the movie. Well, did you have to leave school because of that too, ultimately, because there were some problems? No, no, no. I never had to, uh, to leave school. I've, I've had, uh, I've had problems with people online trying to get me kicked out of school, uh, because okay. I promote more traditional values, but, um, but that's just, uh, that, that luckily having those personal relationships with people at the university faculty, uh, they knew that I wasn't, I, I there was a piece that claimed that I, oh, I run a psychedelic, uh, orthodox cult. That is a fake orthodox <laughs> YouTube channel that, uh, is homophobic, transphobic, and outwardly racist. And so that I am a threat to any people of those minority groups. Luckily the people at university know that I, they know me personally. And so that wasn't a problem. I was able to, uh, you know, deal with that, but, um, it shows you that they're absolutely intolerant in the name of tolerance, that everything is a, is it's a magical spell. Everything oh, no. is, is, is backwards. And so even as doc was mentioning about the herd, um, the herd mentality, the reason why herd animals gather in a herd when a predatory species around them is because it's a survival mechanism, because if you stand out from the pack, you'll actually be killed. And so when we look at the world right now and that that survival mechanism has been weaponized against us, people are so afraid to stand out from the crowd. But if you go along with the herd, you're actually participating in, in a death cult. And yeah. so you're actually you're actually being shuttled off to your own demise. And so to stand up for life is going to then force you. So at the same time, the way you save your life is to become more vulnerable. It's, it's to stand out from the pack. Um, and so it's very interesting how everything you look at right now 
the opposite, the inversion is coming into place, which again, only makes sense in a Christian worldview where sure. as yeah. we move towards, as we move towards the end of time, that's the whole idea is that everything that the Bible promotes and everything that Christianity says is the truth will become inverted. And that's what the quote unquote antichrist is. It's the embodiment of a single person ruling the world from a single point uh, and people worshiping him as God and that the entire global system is going to be an abomination. It's going to be inversion of that, which is ultimately true. Well, you know, Doc and I were talking earlier because, you know, I think both he and I, we were more political. Um, I think that, you know, over the past few years, there's been things that have moved me away from that more and more. But I think what I find challenging with a lot of people, you know, we've got a lot of followers as well, is that they think, you know, for example, that um, the, uh, the, the previous president, I don't even know if that's, can you say that on YouTube anymore? The, the guy that number 45? Yeah, they, I, they I have Trump no idea. Him? I, I yeah. got, again, I had a video taken down in a strike just for talking about a, a very popular doctor that had recently gone on the Joe Rogan experience. And that's the video that Doc was talking about. It's called uh, predatory, predatory animals and uh, the herd mentality. Uh, that got taken down off YouTube for uh, medical misinformation. And uh, what was cited there is, is just reading an article from that particular doctor that has gained quite a bit notoriety just by saying his name and reading his articles is a threat to uh, the YouTube community. And, and that to me is psychologically painful that you can't even discuss so many things now. And that's even why I brought that up, because I'm pretty sure we can still say Donald Trump on YouTube. But right. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow to find out that we can't for some reason. Right, exactly. And they retroactively put in words and then take down videos. Yeah, that's it's crazy. arbitrary. Yeah, it's arbitrary. But that that's the thing, though, that uh, people, I try to explain to people because I try to say to them is that you're trying to fight on this surface level. You think it's just the right versus the left. It's the Republicans versus the Democrats. It's just these things. I was like, it's so much deeper than that. And right. these people, a lot of these people too, are just so untrustworthy. Like, well, you know, his, what he says is a little close to the Jersey I want to wear, but you know what the Republicans who actually, I used this metaphor with doc, the, uh, the Democrats are going for the hail Mary. And the Republicans are just running some ground plays, but they're both headed towards the end zone. Right. You know? right. And if you're counting on these people to save you, I'm very sorry that you're doing that because it's not going to be a positive outcome if that's where you're going to be. And that's the realization that I had to come to in looking towards to, to God and to Jesus, to my salvation that way, because counting on these humans, you're going to be disappointed. And in fact, you may be disappointed in such a way because you're just on the road to perdition. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we, we go ahead, doc. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, doc. Yeah. That's one of the, the biggest struggles, even like uh, myself, there are some things that I just didn't want to like see. And then eventually, you know, you kind of come to that realization or that truth or somebody else kind of uh, nudges at you to like, Hey, you know, maybe this isn't it. Like for me, like the, the church I was going to as well, like certain, certain things just weren't feeling okay and i was like okay well what is it and then ironically enough uh the pastor was saying oh yeah you know like joel osteen he's such a blessing to you know, and I'm like, oh, God, there it is i'm done but yeah just looking at all these things and it's just like hey man is fallible like they're gonna fall and it's just right. you, you gotta be weary of a lot of these things and especially how things are are now like uh, one of the funniest things that always comes back to my mind, uh, my friend's mom, when I was younger, she would just say, yeah, everything's like bad is from the devil. And I'm like, OK, yeah, whatever. And now as I'm older, I'm like, yeah, no, everything that is bad is from the devil and all of these things. And just it, it's not left versus right. It's good versus evil. And now is not right. the time to yeah. be lukewarm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen to that, man. Amen well, to that. Well, it, 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 yeah, people think they can make this bargain with the world. And I think one of the things that was interesting this week, and I don't know if you saw this, DP, but um, it was uh, Bar Mike Cernovich on Twitter. I don't know if you saw yes, him. Yes, he, he read a little bit of uh, Father Spirit and Bailey. And Father Sarah from Rose. Yeah, and Father Sarah yeah. from Rose. And, and it was interesting coming from a person like that, because I think one of the things that I'm going to paraphrase a little bit was he's like, the great thing that he saw about a lot of this orthodoxy is that, these were people who were sticking to their guns. 
Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the things that I appreciate about it. It's the history of it. And it's the unwillingness to bend to the secular world. Again, it was one of those things where I used to think like, oh, you know what, man, if you just accept this a little bit, just work with that. But we see where it's gotten us. Right. And it is really nihilism and everything like that. And it's just, it's, it's painful again, because looking at the matrix of it, what's going on, and you can see how many of these things are driving people away. And again, that's the danger of so much of the transhumanism humanist agenda that is the danger of what you talked about too the hallucinogens as well i honestly i see that and i and i and i struggle with that but you know i, I do appreciate man uh, i think we're coming up here to shut yeah. down soon but i do i do appreciate you taking the time today to really share this with us and share with my audience and i think that you know um we will when we post this up later we'll add a link to that that mask um that you did and some of your links to your site as well so if people are interested in that um you know one of the things i'd like to take some time to just let people know too as well something that um doc and i are working on we're going to be putting together a, a, a something called orthodox disciples um it's going to be a, a little bit different because I, you know like the pbf and the kernel docs we'll, we'll have a crossover between it but it's something that's more orthodox focused that we can just do that I had mentioned before, and my plan is with that, um, I bought some Orthodox study Bibles that I'm going to, you know, in some way we're going to pass out to people. We'd like to get involved in doing a little more Bible study and, and helping people out. There's a lot of people who have asked about this. You know, again, for people that ask, it's not just a study Bible. It is the Orthodox study Bible. You right. can find it in many places. Um, it's very helpful and it'll do the groundwork, but we've got some that we're going to be passing out to people and just be on the lookout for some of that information coming to you guys, because it's really, we, as I was talking to doc earlier, we chose to be a military because be in the military, because we wanted to give service. We wanted to give back to people. Right. And the reality is now that both he and I have come to is that in, in, in everything that we've discussed here in this episode, just to rehash a little bit, it is a spiritual battle out there. And I want everybody to be the, 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 the warriors for God, if nothing else, you know, the best way so that you can fight the spiritual battle. Because as, as DP said too, as well, you know, as when we are choosing to do those things that are sinful and wrong, we are actually giving the power to the demons and yes. to the evil one. And if we want to turn things around in some way, or at least help more people on the right path, we've got to choose to fight the battles from this side and we've got to choose to do the right things. And it's not always easy. It's not easy. I get it. I mean, every day it's a battle, you know, yeah. and the more you get involved with this, I, I, I truly believe it because you hear the saints saying this, you're tempted more and it's, it's more difficult. True. It absolutely is true. Yeah. I tell everybody that when you start to uh, try to go down this Orthodox road, uh, things are actually going to get more difficult because it's absolutely a spiritual reality. The temptations of old, the people you used to know, strange experiences, strange circumstances, the perfect circumstances will arise for you to engage in behavior that you're not supposed to, or that, you know, uh, that, that it, you know, isn't going to lead you closer to God. And this is all part of a, a spiritual reality. And, and until you make that transition in one's heart that, you know, maybe I'm going to look into this and then maybe I'm going to actually pursue this. And then now I'm going to actually do it. And then you're doing it. Um, that's when uh, you'll see the strangest things get to, be, you know, emerge in your life that are going to try to throw you off track. And every time we engage in those sins, our ability to see things clearly gets darkened. And then, and then we ask for forgiveness. We get on our knees. We pray to the Lord. We engage in those uncreated energies. We take communion if you're Orthodox and that, and then at the same time, then you're slowly more cleansed and you can see a little bit more and then we sin and then we darken it again. And so it's a continual process. That's why we as Orthodox never would claim that, that we are saved, uh, until, uh, on judgment day, we actually receive that blessing, that grace from God. Absolutely. So, uh, you, uh, before we got a couple of super chats here, if we want oh, to read, cool. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, I forget. Oh, no. not, this is my first time doing the video type thing. And so like super chats, questions, I, I I'm down, you know, if they got questions for me or questions for you, yeah, whatever. Doc, do you anything you want to say real quick before, uh, diving in? We just have three here. If anybody wants to super chat, you can throw a question in real quick. No, 
you guys pretty much kind of hit the the nail on the head and yeah things have been like getting difficult and it's funny enough that uh we were just going over uh there was a bible verse that's like yeah it's gonna turn even family members against family members during these times yes. and even then now i kind of see that on my side of the family where my own brother uh is going down that on the other side of evil and it's just like like i love him to death but sometimes it's just like look man like just just I got I know I have to be patient, so it's another thing of you know, yep, not seeing these blind spots and you're just like it's the spot that you least expect it, but then it's just saying, hey, Lord have mercy, give me that patience, that time to be able to deal with this the correct way. But yep, uh, no, that's exactly it, and and that's where just in the conversations I've had with people that have gone down this uh, this path is it's often people in your family. I've had uh, you know terrible terrible stories of people that as they got closer to God and actually became uh, better that the, the person they're married with uh, moved in the opposite direction uh, or their family members or their family kicked them out or their family doesn't want to talk to them while at the same time, all we can do is pray and try to live our lives better. And so there's been multiple instances then of people that that maybe initially happened and they continue to pray and all of a sudden their spouse began to warm up that, that maybe their spouse was on the opposite side of things that are going on in the world right now. And just through prayer, not that you tell them you're praying for them, not that you try to be, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, righteous to them, but in the sincerity of your own heart in the privacy of your own heart and prayer to the Lord, that you really do care about them, that, uh, that is what will ultimately through the grace of God could change them if their free will chooses it right? Because it's all based on their own decision. And so there, I've had so many people tell me that they just prayed and prayed and prayed and all of a sudden, six months, nine months later, the person that was totally in opposition to them, um, getting into orthodoxy or Christianity all of a sudden warmed up. I had a great, a great story. I did a one-on-one with a gentleman um, from Finland and he, uh, he didn't know anybody in his life that was Christian. And, and he slowly come to the realization and uh, began praying and began moving down this road. And, and the, his girlfriend, long-term girlfriend, and, and uh, they're getting married, um, totally revolted this idea that he wanted to become a traditional Christian made no sense. I told him, just keep praying, man, just keep going, just keep going. And all of a sudden, now she sees the larger scheme. She sees the larger play here going around the world. And now she asked him, she said, she told him the last time I talked to him, he said, Patrick, you wouldn't believe it. But um, just a week ago, she came to me in private and said, uh, said, you know, I actually, I actually like that you talk to me about Jesus. Now, will you tell me a little bit more? Um, I, I want to start reading the Bible with you. And that's, that's a transformation yeah. of her heart. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a saving of her soul. And that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't consistent, if he didn't fight it, if he didn't try to become disciplined, and if he didn't try to pray for her. And, and that's what, so in, in his efforts, he actually is going to save the person he cares about the most. Yep. So many good stories like that. So first super chat comes from uh, Kristen and she throws in $5 and says, thanks for all your excellent content. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. God bless you and yours fellow Hoosier here in the Hoosier state. Uh, God bless you and your family. Hope your husband's enjoying his haircut. They go to my barber now. Oh, nice. Uh, Next super chat comes from Nathaniel B throws in $20 and says active duty ortho bro reporting in uh, didn't expect to see this awesome crossover stream b- b- between the three of you. Thank you all for your content. Keep fighting the good fight and God bless you all. I uh, appreciate it, man. You know, uh, doing all we can. We're glad we're, you know, glad to have this opportunity too to talk to DP here. You know, I, I think that, that hopefully, you know, we can, you know, maybe sometime down the road, do something else at, at some point as well. Uh, because I think that there are so many people um, looking for hopefully what we're offering, you know, and it seems like we're hitting the right, uh, the right areas and just glad to get that feedback. Absolutely. Uh, And that's, that's to you too, doc, Uh, you know, shout out to you and and all the work that you do as well. Yeah. It's honestly been a blessing. It's turned my life around and then other people as well. And it's been kind of an inspiration. It's what, by the grace of God, it helps me keep going. And sometimes there's, there's times where I do, I'm like, I was like, Oh man, like, is all this worth it? And then I'll get like a message from somebody. I got one the other day. Uh, these three kids are in sniper school in the army and they're like, Hey doc, 
uh, I got a little icon corner where me and two other guys, we sit and we pray and every day in the morning, I mean, anytime we have time and I'm just like, you know what? Hey, thank you, Lord, just for that. Just if I'm able to do something small enough for someone to motivate them to stay strong, it's, it's honestly been such a huge blessing. Absolutely, man. And, and, and that's where, uh, as, as people who congratulate you, uh, as we all struggle with our own spiritual lives, it, 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 it's, it actually keeps you more humble because you realize how things that you do and say are outside your own control and that God ac actually can use you when you choose to be a tool for God. And, uh, and then you just pray that you, you don't fall away and that you don't blow the opportunity that God's given all of us, uh, whatever platforms we have, whatever influence we may have on other people, that's, that's a blessing. And now it's part of our own judgment and our own responsibility to make sure that we don't blow it and that we don't lead people astray, especially in such difficult times. Amen. Well, you know, what's cool too. In my chat here, I just looked and saw father turbo has been listening and he just said, great conversation, gentlemen. So that's always a pleasure to see, uh, see oh. my spiritual father, uh, giving a little kudos. Oh, well, shout out to father turbo. I, I want to reach out to him. I'd love to have him on and, and share his story. I watched his conversation with a devotional heart. Um, and just talk to him about uh, masculinity, uh, being a man, trying to fight the, the good fight in today's world. Uh, so uh, shout out to Father Turbo. Thank God bless you and your family and, and your, your beautiful children and, and your wife and, and hope everything continues to go well for you. Definitely. Last super chat comes from Cody Bruce and says, thanks for the content. Uh, you're very knowledgeable and I learn a lot. Well, thank you so much, Cody Bruce, for the super chat of $10. I really appreciate your support, brother. And uh, that goes for everybody who uh, listened to the stream. Um, uh, again, major thank you to, to Romeo and to Doc for coming on here. I'm sure that this is going to be beneficial for a lot of people listening. Um, it's great to hear voices within the uh, with, with, within the military, uh, talk truth in a time in which truth is literally being legislated against and being censored. So uh, uh, God bless you guys in your work. Uh, any, any closing comments you want to say before hopping off here? You know, just to reiterate, uh, appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate everybody who's listening now and uh, keep your eyes and ears open as uh, we will be adding uh, more content for you guys. Yeah, same thing. Just thank you for the opportunity and for everyone that's like struggling out there. Hey, it, it gets better, even though it's going to get worse. It's going to get better. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, again, thank you guys. Thanks to everybody who listened today and who participated. Please smash that like. Uh, also make sure that uh, you follow our gentlemen. Uh, I, I, so let me know guys, after this stream, send me all your links that you'd like for me to post in, in the, I, I have your Instagram links obviously, but um, any links that you'd like for me to share in the video uh, description, I'll definitely post those there. So anybody listening, sure. make, make sure you check out the video descriptions for all the additional links. And so uh, God bless everybody. Enjoy your Saturdays. And if you're Orthodox, and even if you're not, make sure you get your butt to liturgy tomorrow morning and uh, celebrate the blessings that God's bestowing upon all of us, despite the absolute craziness and the upside, upside down inverted agenda of the evil one. So God bless everybody. Until next time, I'll see you guys uh, probably either, probably Monday, Sunday or Monday, either tomorrow or Monday. But until then, as always, God bless. God bless. God bless. All right, gentlemen, we are done.